All right, so we, we, are, uh, we, we have kicked off last week on this great series on Route 66, a spiritual adventure, uh, really from the creation of the universe to the coming of a new heavens and a new earth on Route 66, the uh, 66 books uh, of the Old and New Testament. Uh, last week, we kind of set the stage. Those first 11 chapters of Genesis, I was thinking about this week, too. I mean, they are so critical because everything that comes afterward is really rooted in what we are told about the nature of reality, the nature of God, uh, and that found in those first 11 chapters that God is the creator, uh, that he created us with free will, that we use that to choose rebellion uh, instead of obedience, and so humanity, and really the entire cosmos, the scriptures tell us, uh, fallen, something is radically wrong, as that worked itself out in uh, this, you know, primeval period of history, it gets climaxed when, uh, when humanity becomes unsalvageable, and uh, God uh, judges us uh, in terms of uh, the flood of Noah, and then finally, at the end of that uh, little section, those first 11 chapters, uh, the incident of the Tower of Babel where language is confused and where uh, those language groups then spread out uh, throughout the known world. And all of that, though, um, and if you look at the end of chapter 11, you start getting into some genealogies there because everything is sort of leading up to um, the beginning of uh, where we're going to start today, Genesis chapter 12, and, and the way I think about it, a little bit this way, what we saw were the two big, big takeaways last week. Number one, that nothing is the way it ought to be. And by the way, I would say, if someone said, what's the Bible all about? Uh, I think you can summarize the Bible in two statements, and this is one of them, okay? That what the Bible tells us is nothing is the way it ought to be. Because normally you'll be engaged in conversations where someone will say, well, how could God let that happen? And the answer is, well, nothing is the way it ought to be. But the second takeaway, which I think is the second big message of the Bible, that God's going to fix it. And uh, really, that's the whole Bible. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> no, anyway. Um, and, and what we see today, as we kind of get into this uh, next phase, is we're going to see that plan to fix everything launched. And uh, it has to do with this second part of Genesis and we'll get into that this morning. Now, we're gonna leave Chicago, all right, and uh, we're going to hit the road, and as we hit the road, again, uh, there's eight states that Route 66 goes through. I'm gonna use those as eight legs of our journey, and the first leg, uh, obviously, is uh, Illinois, and uh, in Illinois, we're gonna make five stops, and we're going to look at the first five books of uh, the Old Testament, and our first stop, as we move through uh, Illinois is in Joliet. And uh, I, I think I told you that Joliet played a, uh, a very important part in American pop culture. Maybe I didn't say that in my little note that I sent out. And I tested our staff and right away Dave knew what it was, which makes me a little worried about Dave when you find out what it is. And really, and then I was with someone last night and they immediately said the same thing. Joliet, Illinois, when you get to Joliet, you wanna go uh, to Rich and, you wanna, okay, Joliet, you wanna go get to Rich and Creamy, the little uh, you know, ice cream stand there. And the reason you wanna get to that is if you look up in the left-hand corner, it's because it's famous for a couple of guys dancing on the roof of Rich and Creamy in one of the classic uh, movies of American pop culture, which of course is the Blues Brothers. And so uh, Joliet is actually the hometown of Jake Juliet Blues and his brother Elwood. And of course, the theme of the movie, if you are holy enough to have never seen it, uh, <laughs> is that they are on a mission from God. And we're going to look at four men today who also were on a mission from God. And the corresponding biblical uh, text, again, is the book of Genesis. And there in Genesis, uh, we start with a man named Abram. And of course, he is on a mission from God himself. The purpose of Genesis, again, you know, big, big uh, ideas, uh, not into the minutia, but when you get to the second half then, if, if the first part of Genesis, first 11 chapters, tell us again that nothing is the way it ought to be and that God's going to fix it, what happens now in Genesis chapter 12, it's the launch of the plan for God to fix things. 
That's what this second half of Genesis is all about. It's also the origins, because Genesis is a book of, of origins, the origin of the universe, the origin of humanity, the origin of the fall, the origin of languages, uh, you know, all of these origins. It's the origins of the nation of Israel, which is the nation God has chosen to work through his plan to ultimately fix all that's wrong. And it begins with a man named Abram, roughly 2000 BC. This is really, um, you know, most, well, gosh, I don't want to say this. Um, really, we begin to have the ability to date what happens now in Genesis. Those first 11 chapters, very difficult. It's called primeval history. And again, we do know when we hit Abraham that we're, we're Abram, who becomes Abraham, we're, we're looking around 2000 BC. And here's what we read in the text about this guy. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. When we first meet Abram, uh, he's way over here in an ancient city uh, called Ur. And Ur, if you look at the map, by the way, just kind of down the road from where the Tower of Babel was, by the way, uh, pretty close to the Persian Gulf. It sat on the Euphrates River, and it was a, uh, a metropolitan city uh, of the ancient world. Uh, advanced, sophisticated uh, culture and society, part of the kind of the, uh, the Sumerian Empire. And when we first meet Abram, we're, we're told that he's from Ur, but I think even by the time we get to Genesis chapter 12, because we're told that the Lord had told him and uh, where he is going to leave from actually is up here uh, at the city of Haran. And so the whole family has moved from Ur uh, up to Haran. But th there, uh, God says to him, I want you to leave your family and, uh, and I want you to go. And, you know, you can imagine Abraham saying, where? And God simply says, where well, I'm going to show you. So Abraham, you know, leaves Haran and He's going to come down here to the land of Canaan. And there in Canaan, we're going to see this promise and this covenant begin to be worked out. The promise, by the way, I will bless you, that word blessed, did you notice how often it showed up in that text, that God is going to bless him, God is going to make from his descendants a great nation, and through that great nation, through Abraham's descendants, all nations on earth will be blessed. Back when we uh, went through the narrative, just the, uh, the story of the Bible, which uh, took us three years to get through, um, you might remember that we were doing it as if it was a screenplay, and, and this little incident uh, we referred to as the inciting incident. In a screenplay, uh, in a movie, the inciting incident is that event that takes place very early in the story that sort of launches the story into action. And in terms of the Bible, I, I really believe that, that the call of Abraham and the promises that God makes to him and what, where this ultimately goes, I kind of think of as the inciting incident uh, of the entire Bible, certainly a, a, of the book of Genesis. One of the things we saw last week was that, that when the fall took place and uh, man was separated from God and, uh, and sin really entered the human race, and we saw that with that, that that, that which had been blessed uh, now is cursed. And so humanity is living under a curse, and with the call of Abraham, what God is going to do, he's going to do something that enables men and women again to experience his blessing. And so blessing is a huge theme here. And it's very interesting that in the call to Abraham, this is what God highlights. I'm going to bless you. Um, you're going to become a blessing. Uh, you're going to be a great nation. Through you, all nations on earth will be blessed. And ultimately, 
Uh, the fulfillment of that call and promise is the coming of Jesus Christ. And Frank, in the New Testament, uh, the book of Galatians, when we get there, it makes reference back to this incident on a number of occasions. And it also says that that promise of blessing also was fulfilled with the gift of the Spirit. So that when we come to faith in Christ, open our lives to Him, and He comes to dwell in us by His Spirit, we, uh, having lost the capacity to really experience God's blessing, um, that gift it is now reactivated in us and we have the ability to live in this relationship with God so that that which was lost, again, as God launches out on this plan, um, part of that is that, that he wants to restore us to a relationship where we can experience his blessing in our life. Kind of interesting, by the way, when you think about this, I love this little verse in Hebrews. Hebrews gives us a little insight into Abram, by the way. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is the great faith chapter, and it, it talks about what many of the heroes of the Bible had done and how their action was motivated by faith. And, uh, and it talks about Abraham. It says, by faith, you know, you know he left uh, Ur, uh, not knowing where he was going. Um, and then it makes this little statement, for he was looking forward to a city or the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Here's this picture that I get of Abram at this point. You know, he's living in, maybe you might think of it as the New York City of the ancient world. Uh, they, they live in houses, by the way. They, they have dwellings. It's sophisticated. Uh, and in a sense, you might think of the fact that uh, almost anything uh, that a person could experience that they might um, look at as the purpose or the reason of life, you know, they could kind of experience here. But Abraham, something was wrong. You know, Abraham is a guy that sort of, you know, internally, uh, and I think that that's what this text is saying, Abraham, he was looking for something better. Almost like, almost like what, what triggers God coming to him is that here's a guy who's saying there's got to be more than this. And again, God comes, Abraham leaves. And by the way, he's 75 years old when he leaves Haran and heads toward Canaan, and his wife, Sarah, is 65. Genesis chapter 15, a couple of chapters down from this, um, God is going to reaffirm this covenant from Genesis chapter 12. And, and what he's going to, to tell him is he's going to re-promise that Abraham will have descendants. Abraham has no children at this point in time. And, and he, he takes Abraham outside and he has him look at the night sky. And he has him look at all of the stars in the sky. And he says to him, you know, that, that, that your descendants are going to be more numerous than this. And Abraham, we're told he believed him. He believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He's 85 years old at this point in time, and everything hinges on him having a son. And uh, so uh, he believes God, but Sarah struggles with it a little bit. And so she says, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I mean, she's only 75 at this point. You know, oh yeah, I'm gonna have a baby, sure, you know. Um, and Sarah says, I've got an idea. I'm beyond the age for this, so how about take my handmaiden uh, my servant and, and have a child through her. Well, God never wanted that. This is sort of Abraham and Sarah's do-it-yourself project. And, uh, and out of that, uh, he, he uh, has a relationship with Hagar and an, a son is born named Ishmael. And the conflict between the son of the promise and the son of the do-it-yourself project is going on today. I mean, throughout the ages, this conflict between the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Ishmael. And, and, and I don't know if Abraham at this point in time kind of thought, well, this is it, and, you know, and things are going to kind of work itself out. But uh, uh, 14 years later, when Abraham is now 99, and Sarah, 89, 90, uh, right in there, depending on when their birthdays were, which we're never told, uh, I thought that was kind of a clever little statement. No, just kidding. Anyway, uh, so, so, you know, the, the, the angel of the Lord, three men show up, and, and we believe this is, again, one of those 
uh, sort of theophanies where God appears in the Old Testament, perhaps even a Christophany, that one of these angels could have been the manifestation of Christ himself. But basically what they say is this, you know, you're, you're going, you're going to have a child. Now, Abraham is 99 years old. And uh, Sarah, again, 89, 90, and she laughs. Ha, <laughs> ha, yeah, yeah. And they kind of say, well, why'd you laugh? And uh, she says, well, I didn't laugh. No, I didn't laugh. And of course, he says, well, you laughed, you know. Anyway, long and short of it is that God comes through. They have a child. They name him Isaac, and Isaac means laughter. And so there's this, this connection there. And so a son is finally born. The son of the promise, his name is Isaac. One of the key parts here in, uh, in the book, in, in, in the story of Abraham, is that now about 13 years more down the line, here is the son that God has promised that through him, uh, somehow, ultimately, uh, there are going to be more descendants of Abraham than stars in the sky. And God says, go take him up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. I think, you know, you, the first time we read this, you know, probably most of us just say, I, you know, I don't get it. Uh, I can't even imagine this. Now, remember, though, remember, Isaac's 13 at this point in time. He's an adolescent. It might not have been really as hard as we might think, but anyway. Um, and, and you know the story. He's called to sacrifice him. He takes him up on Mount Moriah, by the way, the place where ultimately the temple of Israel is going to be built. And, uh, and there, uh, Abraham is willing to sacrifice his son, and of course, he passes the test. Um, I, I'm assuming God never really wanted him to sacrifice his son. He just wanted to see um, whether the son or God was number one in Abraham's life. And, uh, and the promise now gets passed on through Isaac, who becomes the second man in Genesis. Four men, remember, here in the second half uh, of Genesis. So Isaac becomes the second man. Oh, let me go back one second here. So Isaac who's the son of promise, uh, and uh, Ishmael, the son of do-it-yourself, there's this conflict that leads to the split, as we said. One of the things about Isaac is that Isaac, um, Isaac doesn't do a lot in the text. Um, you know, he, he's, he's, the, he's the guy that, uh, at this point in time, he's, he's the guy that is, you know, the one that, that God promised. And in a sense, the biggest thing that Isaac does is he has two sons. And uh, his sons are Esau and Jacob. And Esau is the guy, now e Esau is the one that dad really likes. Esau, um, you kind of get this idea, he, he's the man's man of the two brothers. And uh, we're told he is extremely hairy. And, uh, and we see that when uh, Isaac, of course, is going to try and deceive his father, that uh, part of what he does is that mom says, here, put these goat skins on you so that when, you know, uh, dad reaches out and touches you, he's going to think that it's Esau. Well, I mean, that means Esau is a pretty hairy dude, you know, and his name means red, by the way. So uh, here's, here's sort of dad's favorite pick. But the second son, you, you get this sense, is really sort of, I don't want to say a mommy's boy, but she's, he's, he's mom's favorite. He's mom's favorite, and, uh, and he's a character. I mean, again, uh, Jacob, you're going to have a great time. He's my favorite character out of here uh, because he's a guy I think a lot of us can identify with. When he's born, okay, so when he's born, Esau's coming out first, and, and from the womb, he reaches and grabs the heel of his brother, and he gets named heel grabber. That's what he his name means Jacob. It means heel grabber. And in their culture, uh, that was an expression of someone that was sort of manipulative and uh, a little bit of a deceiver, a little bit untrustworthy, you know, and, uh, and, and that's the character of Jacob at this point in time. Um, Excuse me, I'm getting a phone call on my iPad. Oh, no, 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 they're not going to do that. I don't know if I can. Oh, there I am. Oh, good, got back on there. So um, here's the deal about Jacob. Jacob, 
from the womb, it would seem, he wanted the right thing. He wanted the birthright, he wanted the blessing uh, of his dad. And we get the sense that for Esau, it, it just didn't mean anything. And so the problem with Jacob was not that he wanted the blessing, it was how he went about trying to get it. And you probably know the story, you know. Um, uh, we have this, this incident where Esau is famished, he comes in from hunting, and uh, Jacob is, you know, cooking up a little dish there, and uh, lentil uh, stew, and Esau says, give me a bowl of that, and Jacob says, okay, but I'm going to sell it to you. And what I want for my bowl of lentil soup here is I want your birthright. I want you to give that to me. So I'm going to buy that from you so that I become the number one son. And there were a lot of implications of that. Uh, the firstborn son, the one that got the birthright and the blessing, got a double portion from uh, the other you know, children in the group, and it, was, it, it, carried, you know, uh, it carried some gravitas with it. And Esau, um, we're told, by the way, later on in, in the scriptures, that he despised his birthright. We're also told he was godless. And, uh, and he sells it for a bowl of soup. Now... What I think we don't see oftentimes is this. Uh, as this begins to play itself out, the time comes when uh, uh, Isaac, who doesn't know about any of this, is, you know, he knows he's getting ready to die, and he's going to now impart the blessing, and he's going to impart the birthright. And notice in the text, because we always make Jacob the bad guy here, but what happens in the text? Esau's ready to get it. Now, he's already sold it to Jacob, but when the time comes, he's going to go get the birthright. And, of course, he goes out to hunt, to uh, you know, prepare a meal for his dad. And Rebecca, mom, comes up with a plan. Uh, we're going to put goat skins on your arms, and we are going to fool Isaac into giving you the blessing. And now, you know, most of us are thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, I mean, what's that all about? You know, I mean, as soon as they find out that it was you know, they deceived him. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it kind of revert back? And the reality is in their culture, the, the imparting of that blessing and birthright was irrevocable. Once it was done, uh, nothing could be done to change it. And so Jacob deceives his father. Uh, Isaac gives him the blessing of the firstborn and the birthright. And when Esau finds out about it, he sets out to kill Jacob and Jacob has to flee uh, to his uncle uh, Laban where he is going to get a big dose of his own medicine. So that, although we've already talked about him, kind of transitions into the third man who is, who is Jacob. And so Jacob now, as an adult, uh, he reverses uh, trajectory here. And in order to keep from getting killed, he goes back to where we started from in Haran. And there his uncle lives. And his uncle, again, is a guy by the name of Laban, who is as much of a manipulator and a deceiver and a cheat as Jacob ever hoped to be. All right. And so uh, he gets there. He gets there to Uncle Laban. And the first thing that happens is that he, uh, he, he rescues, uh, you know, kind of does a good deed for some women at the well. And one of those women is the daughter of Laban, and uh, her name's Rachel. And what we're told in the text is that Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Living Bible says, pretty face and shapely figure, you know, so <laughs> anyway... Uh, but she catches, she catches, you know, Jacob's eye, and it's, it's kind of a love at first sight sort of a deal. And so he goes to his uncle and asks for her, uh, her hand in marriage, and Uncle Laban says, well, you can have her, but you've got to work seven years first. And if you work for me for seven years, at the end of seven years, um, I, I will give you uh, her hand in marriage. And so Jacob works for seven years, and the time comes, of course, seven years go by, big night arrives, enters the tent to consummate the marriage. A little bit of what was quite going on there, a little hard exactly to tell, because he wakes up the next morning, he looks over, and it's not Rachel, it's Leah, her older sister, and the only, the only good thing 
that the text says about Leah is that she had weak eyes. That was, that was you know, Rachel's lovely and shapely in form. Leah, she's got weak eyes. And then her name means cow. I, I, you know, you can take that for, for whatever it means. Now, I, you know, by the way, I don't think they were being mean to their kids naming these, these things. I mean, you can kind of imagine, you know, when, you know, she's born and they look and maybe, maybe she's got these really big eyes, you know, and, and uh, you know, and they're kind of looking at her and say, oh, she's so cute. And, and you look at her, oh, look at her eyes. You know, they, they remind me of Bessie, our cow, you know, and they're saying, well, let's call her Bessie. And then, you know, and then, and then he goes, no, 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 no. Let, let's go for the whole deal. Let's just call her cow, you know. So, I mean, sort of endearing, loving way. That's probably not how it happened at all. So anyway, but you know, what happened? So he's really upset, and he goes back to Uncle Laban, of course, and says, hey, what's the deal? And, you know, Laban, you know, again, it almost sounds like Jacob. Well, you know, I couldn't give you the younger one until we married off the older one, and so we had to marry off the older one first, and that's why it was Leah and not Rachel, and, and, and honestly, just work for me another seven years, okay? And, uh, and you can have Rachel. My sense is, is that God is just really working on Jacob, Again, giving him a big dose, uh, you know, of his own uh, sort of manipulative, you know, way in life. And ultimately, he's getting ready to really break him. And uh, the, the climax then uh, of this is that finally the time comes where Jacob is uh, going to head back to his homeland. And he hopes he's going to reconcile with his brother Esau. And uh, he's been 20 years now with Laban at this point in time. Uh, Genesis chapter 32 would be the text if you want to look at it this week, or meet with Dave at nine next week and go through it. But uh, he's, heading, he's heading home, and, and again, you, you get this sense there's, there's a certain degree of fearfulness there. And uh, he comes to the crossing uh, of the Jabbok River. The group of us that were in Jordan uh, we were driving along in the bus, so the whole group that went to Israel didn't all go to Jordan, but a group of us went on to Jordan. We're just driving along in the bus. We've been in Jordan, and we're getting ready to cross back over into Israel, and the bus, our guy just sort of nonchalantly points down, and he says, oh, he says, that's the Jabbok down there. And we were just going to drive by, and so we're all like, stop, 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 you know, and got out and had to take pictures, because this is a, I mean, this is a critical place in, in biblical history. And what happens is that uh, he gets to this crossing, again, he's getting ready to leave uh, what at the time would have been part of Edom, and, and cross back over into the land of Canaan. And, and when he gets to this point, we're told that he, he sends his family ahead of him, he sends the servants ahead of him, he sends all of his possessions, and he's grown wealthy during this time that he's been with Laban. He sends them all ahead, and he, he wrestles with God. He wrestles with God, and it's one of the great stories, I think, in the Old Testament. And we're simply told he wrestles with a man, and most scholars would identify the man as the angel of the Lord, and some would even say, again, Christophany, early appearance of, of Christ in the Old Testament. But, but he wrestles with this guy, and you know, I had an insight one time on this, and I think it's accurate, um, because I don't think that what's going on here, in a sense, is that Jacob... Is Jacob isn't wrestling the angel, Jacob is wrestling himself. And the angel is wrestling with him on his behalf to break him. And, and this, is, this is what I think is going on. There's some reasons for that that I could explain to you, but I'll, I won't. Um, and, 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 and he wrestles all night with this angel, and, and, and in, as the morning is coming, he won't let go. And he says, I'm not going to let go until I get blessed. And now, now the thing that he's kind of manipulated for all of his life and, and somewhere at the core of his being, what he really is longing for, the blessing of God, finally he's going to get it. And he's going to get it when the angel touches him and wounds him for life. He, he's going to limp and use a staff for the rest of his life, but he wounds him in a sense that's this breaking, uh, sort of a very tangible image of that, and then he blesses him, and when he blesses him, he changes his name. And he no longer is simply going to be Jacob, the heel grabber, manipulator, deceiver, but now he is going to be Israel. 
And this is where the name Israel comes from. And the name itself means he wrestles with God. He's a different guy, by the way. And what happens is then he, he meets his brother. They're reconciled. I get a sense something good's happened to Esau, too, because he's really, you know, kind of throws his, his arms wide open. They get reconciled. And he enters back into the land of Canaan that one day is going to bear his name and going to be called Israel. And prior to this, he's had 12 sons. Those 12 sons now will become the heads of 12 tribes that will be the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel and will become the great nation that God promised Abraham. Uh, one of those sons, by the way, is named Judah. And through the line of Judah, a descendant is going to come that will fulfill all the promises because Jesus Christ comes from the line of Judah. And you know what I love about this? Who was Judah's mom? Leah. I mean, God used that in a powerful way. And ultimately, the Savior of the world comes through the wife he didn't ever want to marry. Secondly, in the, that, those tribes, the, the next character that kind of comes to the stage here in the book of Genesis is Joseph. And Joseph then becomes our fourth man, and I'll, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, we know Joseph because he's the favored son. You probably know the story. Um, he, he, he has dreams, and his dreams, as he tells his brothers and his family about him, are all about how one day they're all going to bow down to him, and which isn't like in how to win friends and influence people. That's not, you know, it, and, and what happens is, is he just, his brothers, you know, they end up hating him. And then on top of him, dad gives him this really cool coat, you know, his coat of many colors. And the brothers plot to kill him. By the way, every one of these families are great models of dysfunctional families. Have you ever figured that out? I mean, you look at the chaos of every single one of these families. So the brothers plot to kill him, and, uh, and they end up beating him up and throwing him into a pit. And uh, Reuben's actually trying to save him uh, and keep them from killing him. Uh, but as they're sitting there, and he's in this you know, dry well, uh, is what the pit was, uh, along come a group of Midianite slavers. They're headed down to Egypt, and they decide, well, why, why let him go to waste? Let's sell him. <laughs> and so they do. They sell their brother. They sell him to these guys, and, and he's taken to Egypt, and he's there. He's sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. And quickly, uh, again, I'm sure most of you know the story, uh, you know, Potiphar has a wife who uh, uh, is promiscuous, and she has her eyes on Joseph. Joseph is 17 when he gets to Egypt, and the text says that he is well-built and handsome. So he's sort of the male counterpart, I guess, to, you know, to Rachel here. But anyway, he's, you know, he's a, he's a good-looking young guy, and, and she tries to seduce him. And of course, he flees, and she turns around and says that he attacked her, and the end result is that he ends up in prison. Uh, thrown into prison, wrongly accused, uh, kind of the no good deed goes unpunished you know, idea here. But in prison, he begins to interpret dreams. He's got this gift that God has given him. And when Pharaoh has a dream, and, you know, I'm really compacting the story at this point. When Pharaoh has a dream, the cupbearer uh, and the baker, uh, or, well, I can't remember which one's left. I think it's the cupbearer because one of them in the dream ends up getting killed. Anyway, says, oh, I know, there's a guy that can interpret dreams. He's in prison. And so they bring Joseph out of prison, and he interprets this dream for Pharaoh that there's getting ready to be seven years of great prosperity that are going to be followed by seven years of famine. And he, he's counseling Pharaoh to uh, uh, save up during those first seven years so that when famine hits, you'll, you, won't, you, know, you won't perish. And Pharaoh is very impressed with him, and ultimately what happens is that Pharaoh exalts him to the number two spot in all of Egypt. He becomes like the prime minister of Egypt, out of prison, you know, 13 years. 
he's been either in prison or with Potiphar because he's 17 when he goes there. And the text tells us that when he is exalted to this position, he's 30 years old. Seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of famine. And when the famine hits, it goes all the way up into Canaan. And his family is facing uh, destitution and there's no grain in Canaan, and so Jacob sends the sons down, minus the youngest, Benjamin, that's been born while Joseph is away, and uh, sends them down to get grain to survive. And of course, they don't recognize him. He recognizes them, and there's this great drama here toward the end of Genesis, which you should read. Lots of twists and turns until ultimately Joseph reveals himself sends the grain they need, but he invites them to move to Egypt. And uh, the brothers, by the way, the brothers are, they're still, you know, scared to death. What's going to happen to us? You know, because here's the guy we tried to kill. Now he's this powerful guy. What's going to happen? And one of the great verses in the book of Genesis, uh, well, that's the, that was, uh, is this, Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, I think the translation more literally is, you intended it for, for evil, but God intended it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. And at this point then, Jacob, uh, the sons are there, Jacob brings down the son's wives and their kids and his servants. And do you know how many people Jacob brings with him? To Egypt? 66. I don't know what that's all about, but it seemed, <laughs> seems kind of cool. And, uh, and then the text says, not counting the son's wives. So they, might, they, they must have won in 66 too. Anyway, so they end up in Egypt. And uh, over the next 400 years, these 66, well, it'd be more, closer to 70 now because of Jacob. Or, anyway, 70 something. They become three million people over 400 years. And what God has done is he has created the people to populate his great nation. And as Genesis comes to a close, there is a, a pause of 400 years till we enter into our next stop. And I would say the takeaway from Genesis is the plan is set in motion, okay? for God to fix things, and the next stop then uh, becomes the book of Exodus, and we'll tackle that next week. Let's pray. Thank you. Lord, we are, uh, it's just fun, Lord, to, uh, to go back through Scripture and to, to see your hand on people's lives, and Lord, I, I just pray that as we read through this and we encounter it, uh, that you will keep uh, applying it to, to us that we will understand that in the same way you had your hand on these people and you were working out your plans and purposes, that's absolutely true of us today. You know, we're still in the story. The story hasn't come to an end yet, and we're part of it in the same way that, uh, that these men and women were also. So um, use this, help us personalize, and Lord, uh, just give us a new appreciation for uh, your love for us and uh, the plan you have to fix everything that's broken, Lord Jesus, including us. In your name, amen.